Welcome to the lesson on angle measure. Before we start to talk about angles, we first have to talk about the parts of an angle. An angle is made up of two rays. A ray is simply part of a line that has one endpoint. For the orange ray, it's endpoint A. You notice how the line starts, or excuse me, the ray starts at A and continues forever in one direction. It does not go both directions like a line, and it does not stop on both ends like a line segment. So we have a ray. We have a ray that starts at A in orange and a ray that starts in X in green. We have two rays. Now naming rays, just like when we name lines, just like when we name segments, there is a specific way to name them. If I want to name the orange ray, I would start with the ray symbol, then I would go A, and then either point in the direction of the A. So I could do B, or I could do A, C. But what I absolutely positively could not do is ray B, C. That would be incorrect. Because our ray does not start at B, our ray starts at A. So we always use the starting points and then one other point in the direction of the ray. Go ahead and try and write the ways that you could name the green ray. Pause it for a moment, write your answers down, and then restart the video. The green ray, just like the orange ray, has three ways it could be named. It could be X, Z, it could be X, Y what we couldn't have is YZ. Notice also my arrow always points to the right. That is the normal way you see it. It is possible for you to write X, Z, however then you would have to change the direction of the symbol on top of it. That is also correct, but it is uncommon and it is not preferred to do it that way. We like to always point our arrows to the right. That's how you name a ray. Next, we have opposite rays. Opposite rays share a common endpoint. You can even think of that endpoint as the starting point of the ray. So, so opposite rays have a common starting point. They start at the same point and extend in opposite directions like a line. When you look at the rays, the two opposite rays in front of you, you're going to think of it as being a line. In geometry, we can also call a line opposite rays. We have ray B, A, and we have ray B, C. Notice how both of them have a dot at B and extend in opposite directions. That is why we call them opposite rays. Now, if I was to start over again, and this time, I'm going to start at B and go towards A with one ray, and then I'm gonna start at A and go towards B with the other ray. Notice this time how they do not have a common endpoint or a common starting point. There is overlap. The two rays have an overlap right here. When we talk about opposite rays, there is never overlap. Finally, we get to an angle. An angle is two 
noncollinear arrays that have a common endpoint. When we talk about an angle, a lot of times we don't use the word noncollinear. It is absolutely fine to have in the definition, and that is how your book has it, and that is how many books describe an angle. The key point I need you to remember is that an angle is made up of two rays that have a common endpoint. Now there are a few points to a ray. We have the interior, we have the exterior, we have the vertex, which is this point right here that has a C by it. Then we have a side. Notice how it has the ray symbol. That's because the two sides of an angle are rays. So we have one, two, three, four, five different parts that we need to know when we talk about angles. We have the interior, which is the inside, the exterior, which is the outside, the two sides, which are rays that share a common endpoint, which is called the vertex. You need to get used to the word vertex. You will be hearing it a lot throughout geometry. When you hear the word vertex, you can kind of think of that as being a corner. So far we've learned how to name a line, a ray, and a segment. Next we're going to learn how to name an angle. There are four ways that we can name an angle. First we got to know the symbol. The symbol for naming an angle looks a little bit like an upside down 7. Notice it does not look like the greater than or less than sign. That is a common error when people write down the symbol. If I'm going to name this angle, I start at, on one of the rays and I go back towards the vertex and then back out towards the other ray. Notice I started at A, I next went to C, and I ended at B. C is our vertex, and whenever we use the three letters to name an angle, C, or the vertex, will always be in the middle. I also could have called this angle B, C, A. Notice C once again is in the middle. When we name an angle, you must always use three points or one point. That is our next method. We could just call it angle C. We can use the vertex as a single letter to name an angle. This is probably the least common and least chosen method of naming an angle. As you will see in some of our examples, when we get to naming an angle, if we use the symbol, single letter, it leads to errors. So when given a choice, I would avoid using the single letter. It is acceptable, but you need to be careful. We'll learn a lot more about this as we go along, and you'll see why using a single letter isn't, isn't as advantageous as the three letter. Finally, the last way is to use a number. Now we can't just arbitrarily add a number to our picture, but we're going to pretend that that three was there to start the picture. I can now call this angle three. Those numbers are added for convenience. If it does not have a degree symbol by it, that means we are using it to name the angle. Mainly out of convenience is why this was created. It's much easier to differentiate in a picture where angle 3 is than to say angle ACB. However, those numbered angles aren't always on the picture. So we do need to know 
all four ways of naming an angle so that we can do it properly. Now make sure, do not do the number one error with naming an angle. That would be to call it angle A, 3, B. That is very, very wrong. We cannot use the number 3 along with letters. So don't make that mistake and you should be fine when you name angles. Although measuring angles is probably not new to you, you may have not done it in a little while. We'll do a little refresher. First, you need to put your protector at the vertex. Do you remember what the vertex is? You're right. It's point C. Now once we have our protractor at the vertex, we need to rotate it so that the zero is on one of our two rays. It does not matter which one, you just need to choose. So I'm going to choose that the ray to the right is on the zero. Notice I'm going to trace the ray to the right and notice how I go right over the zero on the protractor. Now, we have two choices for measurements. We could call this about 45 degrees or we could call it about 135 degrees. Let's take a look at this angle again. Does it look like it could only be 45 degrees? Nope, that doesn't seem to be correct. I believe 135 degrees would be much better. As math teachers, we understand that measuring an angle is a little bit challenging because it's real simple because the lines could be a little thicker to be off by a degree or two when we measure things. So if you were to do this question for me and you were to tell me that it was 133 degrees and your friend measured the same angle and said it was 136 degrees, you both would be considered correct. Now, types of angles. Like in science, in math, we call it classification. So we have classifications for angles. Again, you've heard these words before, so this is a bit of a refresher. An acute angle is an angle that measures between 0 and 90 degrees. A right angle always measures 90 degrees. An obtuse angle always measures between 90 and 180 degrees. And lastly, the straight angle measures 180 degrees. If, if you have any questions with these, make sure to ask during class. We learned a new word during section three, which was called congruent. Now we're gonna talk about congruent angles. You'll remember in class when we talked about congruent, it means same shape, same size. The shape part is usually very simple to identify in a picture. These are both angles. That means they're met one of the two conditions. Now we need another thing to be true, which is the same size. Right now, we do not see that these angles are the same size, so we could not call them congruent. However, if they happen to have the two curved arcs in each of them, that would mean they're both congruent. They also could have had three curved arcs inside of them. The number of arcs does not matter as long as they have the same number. So an angle could have one arc, it would be congruent to all other angles with that one arc. Remember, we learned this symbol at the last lesson. The equal sign with the squiggle in front of it, or excuse me, on top of it, that is the congruency sign. 
How we would read this sentence on the bottom of the, of the screen is angle M is congruent to angle N. The reason is they are both angles and they have equal measure. The last thing for today is angle bisector. We've heard this word once before but it wor it's worth repeating what a bisector is. A bisector is an object that cuts another object into two congruent pieces. So if we have an angle bisector, it is an object, or a ray in this case, that divides an angle into two congruent angles. So it bisects, which means to cut, into two congruent angles. You'll notice the green ray was just added when I click the button, and now we have the angle on the left and the angle on the right of the bigger angle created when the bisecting ray was drawn in. That is the end of the lesson for today. Make sure to watch the two example videos and come to class and ask questions if you have any.